Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with 12 recordings featuring the best string playing ever. Ooh, this was a toughie because most orchestras consist mostly of strings. And so choosing the best string playing ever is going to be just a drop in the bucket by nature. There are a million other fabulous recordings featuring amazing string playing because today's orchestras and chamber orchestras particularly have cultivated the art of string playing to an unbelievable peak of perfection. That doesn't mean it's always perfect, but boy, can they play and really play. And you can find it anywhere because it's all a question of like training and what the conductor's temporal preferences are. I will say straight off that there are no period instrument ensembles in this group because the period instrument aesthetic in string playing is completely different from what we normally consider beautiful string playing. And so while there are many very talented period instrument groups, their strings are usually, well, how shall we say, an acquired taste taste may be well worth acquiring. Um, I've heard many groups that play extremely beautifully and their string sections are quite capable. But let's be fair and honest. The best string players are not period instrument players. The best string ensembles are not period instrument groups. And the best string instruments are not those modern reproductions played by most period instrument players. They are the glorious instruments owned by either or loaned to major soloists or owned by the, the fantastic players in the major in the string sections of the major orchestras. And they've been playing together as a corporate entity for decades, and that's what creates a great string ensemble sound, as often as not. Not entirely. There are exceptions to everything, and we're going to get to those. So here are a dozen unbelievably fabulous recordings of music for strings or music with strings in which the strings make just an unbelievably outstanding contribution. Ready? Go! Number one, Barbaroli conducts English string music. Oh God, this is, you know, this is just one of the iconic recordings of string anything in the catalog. You get the Talus Fantasia, by Vaughn Williams and the, the Elgar introduction and Allegro and Serenade for Strings. And I mean, it, it's just it's just a hog wallow of stringitude. It really is. It's glorious, fabulous string playing, gorgeous recording. It's on Warner, formerly EMI or whatever it was. And if you're looking for a string disc, I mean, gosh, that's where you start. I mean, it's got to be. Next, Messiaen. L'Ascension, yes, with the London Symphony Orchestra and Leopold Stokowski on Decca. Now, any discussion of string play, great string play, has to include something by Stokowski because he was, you know, the, the, the king of sensual strings. I mean, I could have used his Decca Phase Four Scheherazade or so many other things that he did. However, I mean, this Messiaen is particularly yummy. When it comes to strings, it's got a whole movement, which is nothing but strings. It's the, 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 you know, the ascension of Jesus toward God the Father on Sunday, July 6th at 8.45 a.m. after breakfast. I, I don't know, whatever. It's one of those long, messy hand type titles. And it's all for strings. And he indicates what kind of vibrato to use. And it's just beyond voluptuous and marvelous. And Stokowski is the guy for that kind of stuff. So that's why I picked it. It's a little off the beaten path, but if you're into string playing, you gotta hear it. Next, Prokofiev, Romeo and Juliet Suites with Ricardo Muti and Philadelphia. This was an important recording in many respects because Muti had taken over Philly from Eugene Ormandy, who we'll get to in a moment. Um, and everyone was wondering sort of what was going to happen with the fabulous Philadelphia string sound. Certainly he did not preserve Ormandy's, you know, extremely voluptuous string bass sonority. He was much more interested in equivalency of balance between sections. But what he did have was an absolute razor sharp feel for rhythm and ensemble. And in these suites, the playing is just extraordinary. It's really amazing. We could have done something from his Scriabin Symphony cycle too, which does 
you know, sort of preserve that voluptuous string thing that that Ormandy did so well. But no, I wanted you to hear the death of Tybalt when the strings are going. It's just, it's just astonishing. It's absolutely incredible. So that's one of the one of the great ones, unquestionably. Now we'll go to the Baroque period. Corelli, the Twelve Concerti Grossi, Opus Six with E Musici on Phillips. Now Decca. Uh, you know, E. Musici was, for its time, just the acme of cultivated string playing, along with one other one other group, which we'll get to shortly. I, they were just amazing. They're, just to listen to them play was such a joy. I mean, the, their ensemble values were the highest. Their tuning was impeccable. Their sonority was burnished and beautiful and elegant. It was everything that that that, like I said, cultivated string playing was supposed to sound like until the period instrument people screwed everything up. But yes, absolutely glorious. And it's still just as glorious as it was. And if Corelli were around today, as we know, and he could compare, you know, the the whoever the hell Academy of whatever early something to E. Musici, we all know what he would choose, don't we? So there you go. Next, Mozart serenades, all of them, nine CDs in a box. All of them except the, I think, the Hofner serenade, unfortunately, or the post horn serenade. One of them is missing. It's on DECA, but you can get it anyway. Um, with the Mozartium Orchestra of Salzburg under Shandor Weig on Capriccio. Now, Shandor Weig's recordings are all special, every single one of them. And one of the things they are special for is this unbelievably vocal, human, gorgeously phrased just incredible treatment of the strings, which is what the, you know, Camerata, whatever it is, Academica, Mozartium, Salzburg, something is. It's mostly a string band with other orchestra, with other bits thrown in as necessary. Now, he made a lot of live recordings for Capriccio, but everywhere where you hear Shandor Weg play, you hear incredibly detailed and, and lifelike and expressive string playing. And these Mozart serenades are, you know, a classic example, possibly the iconic example of that approach. One of the things that made his approach to string playing so special was his ability to get the players to articulate and give life, even to simple accompaniment figures, even to tremolos, or, you know, just those repeated chicka 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 things that you always hear in classical pieces that sort of buoy the, the melodic elements. And he managed to get his even accompanimental subsidiary voices to always keep the texture alive, crisp and alive and refreshing. It's really amazing. So if you want to hear the art of string playing at its most humane and expressively immediate, you've got to get some Shandor Vey. You just do. And it's either this or something else, but you have to hear it. Next, Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony with the Vienna Philharmonic. That's kind of like a, you know, in the classical music biz, we all know it's a string festival. It really is. I mean, the Vienna Philharmonic, of course, has one of the world's great string sections. Absolutely. And it's difficult to find something that really shows that off to best effect because most classical pieces are not, you know, I mean, they don't use those gorgeous, romantic, sweeping tunes that show off string sections to their most voluptuous effect. But there are certain pieces and there are certain recordings which are legendary. And the Böhm Beethoven Pastoral Symphony on Deutsche Grammophon is unquestionably one of them. You might also choose the Monteux Pastoral Symphony, which is also unquestionably one of them. But uh, this is really, really a special recording. Some people find the performance itself a little bit on the sluggish side. The scene by the brook does linger. But with string playing that's that gorgeous, you can't really, you can't really argue, can you? I mean, really, it's, it's just unbelievably beautiful. Speaking of unbelievably beautiful, there's Ravel's Mother Goose Suite, not the complete ballet, the suite on Sony with the Kitzerkebel Orchestra and Carlo Maria Giolini. Now, this was one of his, it was one of his specialty works. He, he conducted it all the time and made like 50 recordings of it, but this was his last one. And in the Fairy Garden, he creates string textures that are so diaphanous and magical and translucent. I mean, you just want to melt. It's, 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 it's unbelievably beautiful. It really is. There's something very, very special about this recording. It's as if it's coming to us from the beyond. 
And if you want to hear it beyond string playing, then this is the recording to do it. Trust me. And then speaking of beyond or formerly or whatever it was, Tchaikovsky, symphonies four through six with Mravinsky and the Leningrad symphony, the DG stereo recordings. Wow. This was a string ensemble that was absolutely whipped into shape. And I do mean whipped. I mean like sadomasochistically whipped. I mean like with leather and chains and things. They are playing as if their lives depend on it in these three recordings. The finale of Tchaikovsky sixth. Oh my God. The final lament in, 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 in I mean, Tchaikovsky fourth, the finale of Tchaikovsky fourth. What am I saying? You know, da, 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 that thing. I mean, the, the ensemble discipline at speed with all of their timbral qualities intact. It's like, we don't hear it that way anymore. Nobody plays like that anymore. Nobody could be whipped into it anymore like that. And the the final lament, as I was saying, in Tchaikovsky's Potatique Symphony, or the big tune in the same symphony's first movement, or the slow movement of the fifth, or, oh my God, or the finale of the fifth, where they're all going, the density of sound is just unbelievable. Something you really have to hear for string playing uh, that was a moment. It was a historical moment, and it's not going to happen like that again, probably. Uh, speaking of which, yes, of course, Saint-Saëns Orchestral Works, that wonderful essential classics disc on Sony with the Philadelphia Orchestra in Ormandy, where you get the organ symphony, which is particularly beautiful because the slow movement. Oh, my God. To hear the organ with its celeste and vox humana or whatever it is stops, you know, with its like built in vibrato and then the strings matching it. And it's, ah, it's something else. And then, of course, there's the bacchanal from Samson and Delilah with its hoochie coochie. Doo -doo 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 I mean, the, the, the intensity of sound from the cellos. And, and that sweeping tune in the middle, and then the danse macabre. Oh my God! When the violins, the whole strings come in with the waltz. Do, 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 do. You never want it to end. I mean, it's one of the greatest examples of the Philadelphia sound captured in really good sonics, because that was always an issue there. You know, the recording quality could be kind of iffy. And I could have chosen their English string music disc with the Talos Fantasia that's every bit as amazing as Barbaroli's, and maybe even a little better played, who knows. But we have to go with the Barbaroli on that one. We just do, don't we? Because of the whole album. So there you go. Um, after after Sasson, there's Handel, 12 Concerti Grossi, Opus 6, with the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields of Neville Mariner. Now there's the other great chamber ensemble, which was based on an elevated quality of string playing. I mean, that's really what it was about. I mean, Neville Mariner was himself a violinist, and he trained that orchestra magnificently, and they were known for just um, a, a, a higher level of string ensemble, which was really quite remarkable and incredibly beautiful and striking in its day. Nowadays, we have chamber ensembles, which are really just every bit as good. They are. But back in the day, um, they were special. And their recording of the Handel Concerti Grossi Opus 6 um, for Argo, that one, the first one, um, is still really, really fantastic. It was, it was a, it's a reference recording. It was an iconic release in its day. Um, a fabulous combination of ensemble virtuosity and idiomatic approach to music making, you know, with a nice harpsichord continuo and everything in place. It wasn't period, 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 but it was, it was all of the things you want in a period performance, the snappy tempos and the, you know, that sort of stuff and the transparency of texture with uh, the best in, in modern, beautiful, in tune, gorgeous, tasteful sonority. So there that was. And then we've got more Beethoven. Why not? What modern chamber orchestras can do, which is really kind of astonishing, the Beethoven late string quartets enlarged for string orchestra with the Camerotica, Camerotica, yes, the Erotica Camerotica, the Camerata Nordica, that's what it's called. The Camerata Nordica, the Camerata, I can't say it. Camerata Nordica under Terje Tönnesen. There we go, on the BIS label. 
some of the most amazing string playing I've ever heard in music that's usually done by a string quartet. And so you want to have a chamber ensemble which can match the nuance of a string quartet, that chamber music intimacy, but at the same time also give you some bang for your buck in the big moments, and boy do they deliver. It's one of the great recordings of string music that you will ever hear in your entire life on this mortal orb, trust me. And if you don't have it, you really need it, especially if you like the Beethoven quartets. I've talked about this recording a couple times previously, um, and uh, you know it still has lost none of its lust luster over the years. And last but not least, we have to do a carry-on, don't we? The Bartok Music for Strings, Percussion, and Celesta on Deutsche Grammophon with the Berlin Philharmonic. Now, he did this piece more than once, and he did it with Berlin for EMI in the 50s, just after he took over. It was coupled on CD anyway with Hindemith's Mathis der Mahler, both absolutely dreadful performances in every possible way. And it shows you, if you compare them, just what Karajan did to that string section, because that Bartok, well, the percussion section was horrible and the sound was woody and, and, and gross for, for EMI, but on Deutsche Grammophon, you've got them in full flower. Oh my God, they, it, it, you know, the string texture, the timbre comes at you with physical force. I mean, it's so tactile, you could like reach out and touch it and stroke it and lick it and whatever you want. It, it's, it's, it's a substance. It's a thing. And uh, really, that this performance shows it off like, like nothing else. It's, it's incredible. And what's really particularly good about it, of course, is that the work does everything a string section can do. We're not just talking about long lyrical tunes. We're also talking about rhythmic things and harsh harmony and atmospheric moments and textural things. And it's all there. And it's really something exceptional. Um, even if you don't like the Karajan sound, which was quite oleaginous in places, you know, it was based on this really thick legato that, that, that sort of could become quite sticky sounding, but not here, uh, not here, I, I hasten to add. I mean, the tempos are a bit slow, but wow, what a virtuoso exercise in sonority in a work that's based on that. I mean, it, it has... Of course, it's contrapuntal elements. I mean, it begins with a fugue, for heaven's sake. But it's also um, an exercise in atmosphere and tone color and timbre. And Karajan and the Berliners in their second recording for, for you know, Deutsche, uh, first recording for Deutsche Grammophon, their second recording of the work, um, at least their second recording in stereo. I don't remember if Karajan did a mono one, but it doesn't matter. It is really one of the most extraordinary clinics in in unbelievably characterful string playing that you're ever going to hear. And so there you have it, 12 unbelievable recordings that reveal the greatest string playing ever. I'm sure you'll have some choices too, and you are welcome to share them with all of us. I'm very curious to see what you think as well. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me and take care.